Two Steps From Hell and specifically Thomas Bergeson are the grand masters of epic music. To learn more about how their music sounds, I decided to recreate one of their tracks a couple of weeks ago. I turned to the altar of epic music to learn more about mixing, composition, orchestration, virtual orchestration, and here are the seven plus things that I learned while doing so. Hi everyone, my name is Tom and I'm a media composer with a deep love for orchestral music. And in today's video, I want to take you through a remake I did of Race to Durango by Thomas Bergeson. Now, before you start doing this for yourself, I just want to say one thing. Two Steps From Hell obviously records their music with live orchestras, live musicians, so it will always sound better than any remake you and I could ever create. So be nice to yourself. And the things I explain, I tried not to tie them to any sample library, but make them more general concepts that you can use with any sample library, even free ones that are available. And last thing before we dive in, I just want to go through the four phases that I use when I figure music out by ear. First one is the obvious one, which is listen. Listen to the melodies, the bass notes, the percussion lines, the things that are obvious. The second phase is when you have figured out the obvious notes, but then in some parts it feels like something is missing and you can't exactly pinpoint what it is. So here you go off your gut feeling and listen very closely and see what elements are there that you could have potentially missed that are happening in the background. The third phase is think. When the notes are there and it feels kind of right, you can still think about what good orchestrational practices would be and apply those into your remake. And finally, at some parts, there's just so much going on that all you can do is guess. So guess to your best abilities what could possibly happen there. So now with that out of the way, let's dive into the seven plus lessons that I learned while recreating Two Steps From Hell in Cubase. To really create this big impactful sound we know and love from Thomas Bergeson and Two Steps From Hell, you're gonna need to layer different sounds, instruments, and sample libraries. You can do this for three different reasons, for body, for color, and for effect. One way to increase the body or the volume of an instrument is to just take the fader and jolt it upwards. However, it can help to add different layers of different instruments and sample libraries together to create this big sound. So for example, here in the start, I have three different horn patches playing the same melody and they together add to this rich brass sound. we go towards the end it is about every brass library i have another example of this is also happening here in the end and this is where i have added a bass guitar to add more body to the low end Another reason to layer different instruments is to get a certain color that you want. So some examples in this track are doubling woodwinds with high string ostinatos to get some extra color and flourish in there, or adding bass trombone to low strings for this really brassy sound. Um, but for this example, I want to look at a percussion section. So when I was working on this part, I looked through every single snare drum that I have, um, but some of them were too tight, some were too far away, some were too deep, and I couldn't really get this deep group snare drum sound that I was hearing in the track. So in the end, I made a mixture of different snare libraries, but I still wasn't 100% satisfied. To get this deeper sound, I added some tenor drums and drumline bass drums as well. And when you hear everything together, you don't really pick them out as them being tenor drums or bass drums. They just mix with the snare drum sounds to create this specific color that I wanted. And finally, there are parts where I layered multiple sample libraries to create a certain effect that I wanted. And in order to do this, it's very important that you know the sample libraries that you own and that you really know what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. So you can pull upon them when you need them to create certain effects. And the most clear is in the opening. Now, when this is played on a string instrument, when it's recorded, they just put their bow on the instrument and go back and forth. However, most libraries, when they have short notes recorded, they are just all recorded separately. So to create, create the same effect can be kind of difficult. Um, so here I layered three libraries to create this effect. First one is the library that does all my heavy string lifting, and that is Cinematic Studio Strings. <laughs> However, it's still a little bit flat, so in order to add a bit more punch to it, I doubled this with Metropolis Arc short strings. <laughs> 
this is not as realistic in my opinion but this really adds a bite to the hole and then finally i used east west hollywood strings and they have an articulation that is kind of a longer short note um so it has the character of a short note but it's a little bit longer than your regular spiccatos or staccato patches And all these layers together then finally make another example of this is in the lyrical section towards the end here we have a brass and choir accompaniment to the string lines that are going against each other and in the track i noticed in some points that towards the climax the horns get this really brassy edge to them and i know the metropolis arc horns have this uh, brassy edge so just for this part i added those short notes to put a little bit more emphasis on this brassy effect so if i would play it without It is building towards the climax, but it's, yeah, it's just missing something. So now with. The second lesson I learned while making this remake is something I'd like to call developing ostinatos. One thing that has always struck me about Thomas Bergeson's music is that his string ostinatos are always very interesting and going all over the place and are often melodies in themselves as well. A string ostinato is a repeated pattern that can often form the drive behind the composition. In this track, um, he doesn't have one ostinato, but we see very clearly that he starts with a certain type of material, then introduces something else. And from those two building blocks, he creates new and interesting string ostinatos throughout the whole track. So in the opening, when the melody hits, we start off with this repeated pattern. So this is defined by a higher note and then a couple of repeated lower notes. Uh, however, if you listen very closely in the track, there's at some point a little extra thing there as well. And I decided to put it in the whole section, uh, which can be heard in the oboe. And here, listen closely to the last couple of notes from every bar. So this little long short, long short motive is introduced here and it's something he uses as well. So we see here in his introduction that he introduces two types of ostinato material, the high with the repeated low notes and the long short motif. And now let's call these cell A and cell B and see how he develops these throughout the piece. Now let's listen to the next part where the ostinato is prominent because here we see that he starts changing it up a little bit. <laughs> So here the A and B cells start coming together. So we start off here with something that is like a little variation on the A cell. It's not three repeated notes anymore, but he now goes, uh, the middle one of those goes lower, da 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 da. But it still reminds us of the A cell. Then in this little in-between bar, we have long short going all the way down and he closes it off with A again. So what's happening here, he keeps using the same two cells, but starts developing, expanding upon them and also putting them together in order to create new interesting ostinato material that isn't becoming repetitive throughout the track. So in the next part, the ostinato starts going crazy, but we can still boil it down to these two main cells that he has introduced in the beginning. <laughs> In this part the notes are going all over the place but the main building block of this ostinato is still the b cell um, so it keeps going with this long short motive and from here we also start recognizing the jumping motive again a bit more because it starts jumping around a bit more with the which recognizes us of the a cell and so from here it's still the b cell that is the main material but he starts throwing in little reminders of a in there with all the jumps going around um, but it's still developing from these two small building blocks and turning those into longer ostinato patterns now let's make a jump towards the end of the piece so when we are building towards the climax we hear the alternating uh, a cell which is going back down and up and when the climax hits um, we now have this same sort of motive that is displaced by a beat with a little bit of extra material added so it feels new and it is new but we can still trace its roots back to the original material that was introduced way back in the beginning and when there are some breaks in the melody those are parts where the ostinato can take over for a little bit 
And in these moments, he introduces the B cell again and starts crafting new melodies with just based on this rhythmic pattern of long, short, long, short. <laughs> the ostinatos he uses and all the like the crazy rhythmic fast things going up in the high register they always seem fresh they always seem new but we can always trace them back to the first little cells he introduced in the beginning which he uses as building blocks to append upon throughout the whole piece the third lesson i learned has everything to do with background filler there were parts where i had figured out the percussion melody bass lines and everything but i still felt like something was missing but i couldn't exactly pinpoint what it was so let's play this before i had figured out what i think it was <laughs> Basically everything is in place, the things that are important, but there still felt something was missing. Uh, and after listening very carefully, I noticed there was some kind of a repeated string pattern going on. And I didn't know exactly what it was, but I got the idea of it. And that is when I entered these notes in violas and violins too. So it's very easy, it's just rhythmical filler in uh, the root note in the fifth of the chord. But if you add everything together, it fits exactly in this gap where I was missing something and where I felt my remake was lacking power compared to the original. <laughs> And these notes just help fill this mid-range. We don't need any more crazy ostinatos or other big chords or anything. We already have those. But this is just some very light rhythmic material, which you could do with single notes, chords, or even clusters to just nicely fill out this mid-range and give your track more power. Something similar happens in the lyrical section, where we have these melodic string lines supported by some background orchestration and the strings on themselves, they sound great because it's, it's dense, it's melodic, it's interesting. <laughs> But here in the original track, there was more going on in the background and I couldn't pinpoint exactly what was happening everywhere, but I noticed there was this background orchestration going on, which was adding resonance and depth and body to the orchestration. So I added partly by listening and also partly by just thinking for myself. Uh, I added some choir and some brass notes and also a bass clarinet, uh, because bass clarinet has this nice round warm sound that really enhances the low end. And everything together just adds this layer of resonance behind these beautiful flowing string lines. <laughs> Lesson number four is about multiple voices, and this goes in two ways. The first one is harmonic voices, and the second one is counterpoint. To make something feel more powerful, you can add multiple voices to either a melody or an ostinato or an accompanying figure. Adding a second voice gives it more strength, more color, and can make it stand out more. And a few examples of this are in the opening, where we have the horn call alternating with the trumpet melody. <laughs> So here, obviously, the main notes are the top ones, but if I would remove them, it would lose a lot of its impact. This is obviously the main melody that is used here, but it loses a lot of its power. Another example of this is more in a high register. So here the main melody is the top one, but again, by adding this third underneath, it just adds a little bit more color to this um, doubling of the trumpet melody. Now the second part of the multiple voice lesson is about counterpoint and counterpoint is a great way to add life and density to your compositions and uh, we can hear this best in the lyrical section this is where every string line has its own interesting melody that would work on its own as well as in the context of everything and they are lines that don't only make sense vertically in the chords but they also make sense horizontally and this whole dense tapestry basically of notes is then supported by resonance as we discussed earlier with the brass section and the choir <laughs> The 
Lesson 5 is what I call Rock Harmony. Uh, one thing I noticed when I was working on this track is that the harmony is actually quite simple. There are a lot of notes going on in bass line, melodies, ostinatos, which often make up the whole scale back and forth two times. And what is supporting that in the meantime is mostly power chords. And for those that don't know, a power chord is something that is used a lot in rock and punk music, mostly as well, uh, where you only have the root and the fifth of the chord. So it's a very open chord, but because it is with the first overtone, it is very powerful, hence the name. Other notes of the chord are usually filled up by movements rather than harmony in the upper voices. So this first example is where we have uh, a bass line and the trombones then have in the mid low have again just the fifth and the root of the chord. <laughs> Another example is in the climax in the end where all the low instruments have either the root note or the root and the fifth. And how I orchestrate these is that usually I have the double basses in octaves, then the bass trombones, tuba, uh, double bassoon and bass clarinet on the root notes, and then bassoons, cello and trombones on the root and the fifth. The sixth lesson is more of a collection of smaller lessons. So here's a quick fire round of small orchestration hacks. So for the woodwinds, you can save your piccolo until the moments where you really need it. For the brass, you can use the really brassy low sound as a coloring effect. So here the brassy trombone notes are not used all the time, but they are used as an accent on the down beat every other bar. When a live horn player plays a loud melody, often on the longer notes, the attack is quite heavy, but then it dies off pretty quickly because all the force is already in the attack. So when you write big brass melodies, make sure to add a quick decay in expression and modulation right after the attack to simulate this. This will also create room for anything that happens after the attack of the note, like ostinatos or accompanying figures. And for percussion, think about the high end. Cymbals, gongs, sticks and everything are a great way to open up your sound by adding high frequencies. In the end, I added tambourine really softly to add a little bit of an accent on the second and the fourth beat and to open up the frequencies in the high. <laughs> There's quite a lot of emphasis on the double bass, so I tend to turn them up a little bit louder than the other strings. And now that we're in the mix window anyway, I would like to have a look to some of the mixing settings that I used. All the different instruments are going to their own subgroups, which are divided per instrument group. Those are then processed separately. I always take, take out the low end we don't use. Then there's some EQ going on. Often also, especially in loud instruments, compression just to shave off the top end a little bit. Everything is then being extended to two different reverbs. The first one is cinematic rooms, um, which is used to put everything in the same room together. The second one is for to give everything a bit of a tail, and that's a Valhalla room. And every instrument is also sent to a parallel compression bus, uh, where I use Supercharger GT. And they have a preset which also adds a nice saturation to the sound as well. Then the final thing before everything goes to stems, I use side chain limiting to make sure that the stems sound the same as the stereo out. And how to use that, there's a great video that I've used about a million times now and I will link to it in the description below. And that's it. There's a lot going on in this track, so I'm sure there are things I missed. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out on social media or drop them in the comments below. I'm planning to do more videos about this track and this subject, which in the future you can check out in this playlist. For now, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one.